you're coming online and looking at this message on our website or on YouTube, if you go to our Sheridan Hills Baptist Church website, you can download these notes very easily in a PDF form and be able to follow along with us. The way we study the Bible, you, we really look at God's Word in depth. And uh, this morning, we are going to expositorily look through a passage of Scripture, um, and uh, particularly one verse here, um, but we're going to look at famous last words, the famous last words, in fact, of Jesus. Uh, many of you have often heard of famous last words of various people throughout history, and um, I love some of the websites that share some of them that are there. Um, I've been encouraged that some of them are very positive in statements of faith um, that people have. Um, even George Washington, his famous last words were, tis well, tis well, all is well. And um, part of it was he was, you know, the, the discussion was about his will and about other things. And he said, okay, this cold, he had a very severe type reaction of a cold, his throat swelled up. And he could tell he was not going to survive, um, rather, died rather suddenly at 66 years of age. And um, he had gathered his wife together around him and some of the people close to around him. They talked about some of the affairs that were there. One of the things that he said was, don't put me in the tomb until at least two days that I've been dead. So we know that he didn't want to be put, <laughs> he wanted to make sure he was really gone back in that day and time. Um, that's interesting. But when it was all said and done, he said, tis well. Um, there was another great um, person in history that simply said this, um, uh, do you uh, truly have um, faith in this? And do you want me to call out um, for God's mercy for you? And he said, why would I need to ask and plead for God's mercy when I know that he is mine and I am his? And uh, he knows that his mercy has been paid for in the cross. And of course, we need that mercy in death. But he was stating, I am already his, and I know that I know that I am his. And this is a great joy. Famous last words, many different famous last words. But this morning, I want us to take just a moment and look at these famous last words that are recorded at the beginning of Acts, um, as opposed to the end of the Gospels. Look with me in Acts chapter 1. And the book of Acts is all about the life of the gospel going on through Christ's followers. Um, Jesus, as we're going to see here, ascends to the Father. And then the rest of the book of Acts is about the church exploding across the civilized world and coming even to where we are today. So look with me as he begins here. Uh, the writer of Acts um, writes in verse 1, in the first book, O Theophilus, so he's writing to a, uh, a man named Theophilus, could be a general term for those who love God. Theophilus means lover of God. And so we see this, that this is, it, it could be individual or it certainly could be to all who love God or reading this account. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Right above that, the Gospels. The, the, the gospel of Luke, most likely, um, in this. But I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do, do and teach. Verse 2, until the day when he was taken up. And so that's what we're looking at now. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 3. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So understand, the first paragraph here, verses 1, 2, and 3, is saying that Jesus lived his life, he died, he rose again, and he showed himself to the apostles, and he commissioned them to go out. Verse 4, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. So they were to stay in Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus is saying, go to Jerusalem, wait in Jerusalem, something's going to happen in Jerusalem. I've already told you that I'm going to come to you with my Spirit, and he is going to come and fill you. Look at now what happens. 
Jesus ascends to heaven, this beautiful, climactic moment as Jesus has risen from the dead, has lived with them for 40 days, and now bodily ascends to heaven. Look at verse 6. So when, he had come, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you not at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're thinking, oh, wow, earthly kingdom, earthly kingdom. Finally, the Romans are going to be done. Jesus rose from the dead. We see who he really is. He has power over death. He's going to set up his kingdom now. Look what it says in verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Verse 8, let's read it out loud together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So they're saying, let's have the kingdom now. And he says, you go be my witnesses. It's not for you to know when the kingdom will be finally realized as has been promised. Look at verse 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, put out there to the side, angels. These are two angels. Come and behold, suddenly they're standing by them with white robes. Verse 11, and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And so he's already told you what to do. He's told you to go into Jerusalem and wait. And this is not a time for you to be standing around like looking into heaven. I've often laughed at verse 11 a little bit. You know, it's, I would be there too. I'd be gazing into heaven wondering, wow, he just, you know, what do we, you know, you're just sitting there still trying to see. And then God in his good grace comes, stop looking into heaven, go do what he said. It's, it's okay. Everything's going to be all right. Go back to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit is coming. So the first thing I want you to notice here, and I've often made this comment about these passages, and I, I think it's good for us to remember that final instructions are usually very, very important. When you give final instructions to other people, when you're um, a parent, um, when your, your children are about to go out, very often, you know, you've been thinking about all day, okay, they're learning to go out a little bit, they're learning to be with their others, maybe they're taking the car or something like that. And just so you know, kids, that's on parents' minds. When, when, that, when you start coming to that point, mom and dad is praying for wisdom about how, how to help you do the right thing and not ruin your life, not, not in, endanger your life, not, not fall off into other things that you don't see that are out there that they know about. So parents are, are thinking about that as you start to do that. And so they will very often look at you and they will give you some final instructions and those final instructions are very important. Um, sometimes when someone is going away for a long period of time, we, we see final instructions in the New Testament as the Apostle Paul would be leaving a group of people. They would, in fact, stay up all night sometimes as they are giving final instructions or someone passing through, giving instructions that are very, very important. Um, so maybe we need to stay up all night sometime and uh, study the Bible. Um, that, that might, I don't hear any amens about that. <laughs> What's the matter with you guys? Aren't you spiritual? You know? Instructions are important. Um, but look at the next part here. These final instructions that Jesus gives substantiate um, all of Jesus' other instructions. This is what puts into motion and validates everything that Jesus has said and done. This is not a passing comment, oh, it's optional, you ought to think about this. No, it's a command that goes with everything else he did. So when he is commissioning his disciples, that commission goes with all of the story of their salvation, all of the story of, their, of God's plan for how they can be saved, how they can have his peace, how they can know his truth. All of it comes together with his grand plan that we would go and be his witnesses. Now, there's a lot of people in the Christian life who think that the great commission to speak the name of Jesus to those that are in the world around us is an optional thing. 
that, you know, I have my relationship with the Lord. Sure, I'm glad he saved me. Sure, I'm glad I heard the gospel. Sure, I'm glad I had a faithful pastor or a faithful mother or a faithful Sunday school teacher. Somebody that brought the gospel, this friend that came to work or whatever it was that brought the gospel to me. And I'm very thankful for that. And, and if we're not careful, we can really, really miss the reality that you don't really have the gospel if you are not embracing all that Jesus has commanded. And we see here that this is a pivotal part of everything that he commanded. Look at the next part here. These final instructions that Jesus gives that we see in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 are found throughout all four gospels. They are clearly given, fill that in, they are clearly given in all four gospels. And so the fact that they didn't just show up in one of the gospels or, or something along those lines, this is a pervasive message that would have come up over and over and over again. And in fact, we see it in the book of Acts. It's driving the book of Acts. The book of Acts is about the early church growing. Why would the early church grow? Because Jesus gave these commands. Because Jesus had this plan. This is a big deal to every true believer. Every true believer has been told not just come and see and not just stay and die, die to yourself and live to Christ, but now we see that, listen to this, every true believer is told, go and tell. Now, there's some of us who get stuck with come and see. We're coming and we're looking and we're, we're kind of we're kind of toying with it a little bit, and we're trying to, trying to understand a little bit, and we got a lot of maybe cultural Christianity from our past, from our parents, from our, our surrounding thing around us. You know, you're supposed to go to church. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that, and maybe that's been one of the reasons you're here is part of the come and see thing, and you think, well, I'm coming to church. I guess I have Christianity. I'm a Christian, and I would say, well, no, I think that you may be stuck at the very beginning stage. Jesus has called us not only to come and see, but when he looks at his disciples and he continues to walk with them, they start to learn that he's saying, stay and die. Jesus is saying, abide in me. Don't abide in yourself. Stay in me. Come and live in me. Die to yourself and live in my power. And as you die to yourself and you live in my power, you discover what it means to know me. Now, there was a lot of people who they would hear that part of the message and they would stop following him. They liked the idea of come and see when he feeds the 5,000 and he heals people and he does all of these things. But when he starts saying, reject the world and die to your flesh, die to all of the other things and, and, and live in me, they start going, oh, we don't like that as much. That's not as appealing. You remember that one of the the, what was called the rich young ruler came to him and said, I, I'm, I want to be one of your followers. I want to follow you. I want to be with you. I'm going to do everything that you say. You, you just tell me. And Jesus said, great. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And what did that guy do? <laughs> Out, just not interested in that. Jesus says, come, stay, and die. But he doesn't only say, come, stay, and die in me, but he says, now that you've discovered what my life is really like, die to yourself and live in Christ, go and tell others. Go and tell them that they too can be, as we've just sung, have the chains broken of sin and the chains of all of the death and the chains of all of the hardship of, of living in your sin and all of the disillusionment can be broken and the clarity of God in Christ Jesus can be yours as you discover what it means to walk with your heavenly Father. I, I want you to see this. So, so these instructions are throughout the Gospels. Matthew chapter 28, we, that, that's probably the most, um, the most quoted Great Commission statement. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then look what it says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Luke chapter 24, you are witnesses of these things. And what are these things? The fact that he came, he suffered, he died, he rose again, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name. You are witnesses of these things, he says. And then look at John 20, 21. Let's read John 20, 21 aloud, and I'm going to f- help you out at the end. Look what it says in John 20, 21. Let's read it. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Fill that in. I am sending you. So this is a very important last command. And I want you to see it very quickly with me this morning as we break down um, not just Acts 1-8, but mainly Acts 1-8. We'll refer a little bit on the other side to some of the other things. The first, there's four things I want you to see Jesus did. Number one, Jesus enlisted his followers. Fill that in. Jesus enlisted his followers. He involved them. Fill that in. He involved them. He included them. He recruited them. And he commissioned them. This is what he does. He, when you're a follower of Christ, you're enlisted in his army. You're enlisted on his team. You are brought onto his plan. And this is an amazing thing. You're not saved to be an individual Lone Ranger Christian. You're called to join what he is doing in the world. This is such a beautiful, beautiful generosity of God that we are entered into his plan. Indeed, notice his very last words. Um, in the whole thing, of everything that Jesus would say on the earth at this time, his last words when he was in bodily form were, to the ends of the earth. You see, this reveals the extent of his plan. Now, this is, this is important for us because what we see here is that the gospel is going to go, fill it in, to the last places and people of this earth. And not only to the last places and people of this earth, but it's also going to go to the last moment of this era. So it's going to go all the way around the world to the places and people of the world, and it's going to go all the way through history, all the way through from this moment into the future until he is ready to come again. I want you to see these two verses that are underneath this. It talks about the fact that he cares about the places and the people. And this is from the fact that you you see that we are going to be as witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So notice this here with me, Matthew 24, 14. In this gospel of the kingdom, Jesus is speaking. He says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Now, notice here in Matthew chapter 24, 14, it's talking about people, it's talking about places, and it's talking about time. So all the way to the end. When that is complete, he comes again. The era ends that we're in right now, and he comes again. In fact, look at John chapter 17 and verse 20. I love this passage. This, this is where I discovered that I am in the New Testament, and any believer who's alive today in 2019, we are mentioned in the New Testament. Um, in fact, over and over again, but this is one of them that just kind of hit me one day that I've, I've never gotten over it. Look at John 17 and verse 20. Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer, and look what he prays. I do not ask for these only, talking about right above that, the disciples that are in front of him. So I do not ask for these only, but also for, circle it, those. And who are the those? Those who will believe in me through their word. Now, the beautiful thing is this, is that if you believe in Jesus Christ, if he is your Lord and Savior, and you have come to saving faith in him, it is because he has used, through the millennia, Brothers and sisters who have been obedient to this command. They have followed him. You see, we believe on account of their words. 
and their words, and their words before and before and before, before through the generations of the past. So, this little phrase that's up here, and I want you to fill this in. Notice the outline that is here. The, pe- the places and the peoples that are there and the moment of this era, fill it in out there off to the side. This is us. Look at the screen. This is us. This is you and me. If you are a follower of Jesus, he has enlisted you and me. We are seen in these texts. We are seen in this calling. So not only has Jesus enlisted his followers, but we see in this text that we're seeing this morning, Jesus has encouraged his followers. He convinced them of three very important things. So he's sending them out for a big task, and he doesn't just send them out without encouraging them. This is so much like the Lord that as he sends them out, he sends them with great courage. And I just love this. First of all, he encourages us by three important things. Letter A, the reality of his resurrection. You see, he knew that when they became convinced that he had risen from the dead, that they would be encouraged. And we see that in verse 3 on the other side of your sheet or on the screen in front of you. Look what it says in verse 3. And he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. What that means is over and over again, if you read the Gospels, he kept walking through walls and walking through doors and suddenly showing up on the lake shore. I mean, he just kept showing up after the resurrection. He told Thomas, Thomas, come here. Put your hands in my, or put your finger in my hands, put your fist in my side. I'm alive. I am him. Over and over again. He even ate with them. You know, I mean, they, they're kind of thinking, does he eat? Does it work? You know, what in the world is this? You know, he's, he's in this glorified state. How in the world does this work? And we see that he is showing them, it's me. I'm alive. I'm not a ghost. I've come back from the dead. And, that I, and I can do this because I am everything that I told you that I was. I am the King of kings, Lord of lords, creator of the universe. And here they begin to see that all that he said was true in this. So the resurrection from the dead, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God, all of that in verse 3. But we also see another important thing that he convinced them of to encourage them. Look at the next part, letter B, the reality of his rapture. Now, this is the idea, that Jesus ascends to the Father. They don't wonder what happened at this point. They know what happened. He told them what was going to happen, and right in front of their eyes, he ascends to the Father. And so they know he is continuing to fulfill what he said he would do. I want you to see this in verse 9. And it says that, and when he had said these things... As they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. This is his rapture. This is his return to heaven. He is being taken up to heaven. Now, that is encouraging mainly because of letter C, the reality of his return. Not only did he say he was going to go, and they see him go, but he promised that he would return. And look what it says. The angel said this in verse 11. And he said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven, I love it. And if you have your sheet turned over, look at it will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. You know what that means? That means he's coming back. Jesus is going to return just as he said he would. And this time when he returns, he's not going to come on the humility of a little donkey. Revelation tells us that he is going to come on a great white horse of power and victory. This Jesus, whom we've been called to testify about, he promised that he is going to be resurrected, and he was resurrected. He promised he was going to go, and he is gone. He has promised that he's going to return, and here the angels that were there encouraging these disciples, saying, just like he left, he's going to come back. Go obey him. 
Go do what he has said to do. Friends, we can find great encouragement in this. We can find great encouragement. Look at number three. Not only has Jesus enlisted his followers, number one. Number two, he has encouraged his followers in this. But number three, he's enlightened his followers. Yes, E words, sorry. That's the way it goes. He has enlightened his followers. And this is where we see that he informed them of his plan. He says, you will be my witnesses. His plan is to not do it himself. Now listen, that is important for true Christians to understand. That it is not God's plan to win your coworkers, your neighbors, uh, your family members, your friends, just between him and the Holy Spirit. That is not the way he chose to do it. What he has chosen to do is for, to, to use you and to me and any and every other believer that is truly a Christian to see others come to faith in Jesus Christ. This is his plan. And we see it here. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where we are now. Uh, we're not... We're, We're not there now. That's where they are. But the idea is this applies to us in our town, where we are. Just like they were in that town, we are in this town. Where they are now, Judea and Samaria, where they are near. And Judea and Samaria, that's the area that's surrounding Jerusalem. And it's interesting that both of those are named because there's other communities too. Um, But the, the, the idea of the country of Judea being there around Um, the the city of Jerusalem, and then Samaria being named, that's seen as another nation of another ethnicity, somebody that is different from them. And in fact, for Jewish people, somebody that they weren't even drawn to and that historically they had been divided from. And so here we begin to see it's not only where you are now here in Jerusalem, but it's also those other people that are different from you, that you've been separated from, the gospel is for them too. And you're called to go to them too. And then look at this, and to the ends of the earth. That's the rest of the gamut. That's the rest of what's been. And this is where they are ultimately bound, that Christ's disciples are ultimately going to go to the ends of the earth and to the end of time of this era for his glory. Now, I've left on your outline there, notice out there to the side, Jerusalem, if you read the story of Acts, chapters 1 through 7, that's what happened in Jerusalem. If you keep going in Acts and you read Acts chapters 8 through 12, that's when the gospel was going to Judea and Samaria. And then if you keep reading in the book of Acts, from Acts chapter 13 all the way to the end, in Acts chapter 28, you see that the gospel goes around the world at that point, that it's going out into the world beyond where they are. So Jesus is so good to tell us what the plan is. He's told you, he's told me what the plan is through his word. Notice this and fill it in. God graciously and generously reveals himself and his plan to those who seek him. God graciously and generously reveals himself and his plan to those who seek him. I love Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. And uh, this was a promise made to the nation of Israel. And it was a nation, it was a promise made to the nation of Israel when they were about to go through a lot of trouble. They were in the midst of trouble and it was going to get worse. But here's what he says to them about really trusting in him. Look what it says on the screen in verse 11. It says, for I know the plans that I have for you. You see, God has a plan for his people. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not calamity to give to you a future and a hope. You see, God has the big picture in mind. He knows what's on the other side of your car wreck. He knows what's on the other side of the broken relationship. He knows what's on the other side of the cancer. Notice this in verse 12. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. In 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord search to and fro across the whole earth that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. 
God is about letting us know what the plan is, and he is about supporting us in obeying the plan. So God does not call you and me to go out into the world to proclaim the gospel in an ignorant fashion. He's given us his glorious plan. He said, here's the plan, here's the game plan, here's the strategy, this is what we're doing. My word is the strategy, my spirit is the strategy. Strategy. Your obedience is the strategy as he calls us to go and includes us in what he's doing. Um, another one of my favorite passages in uh, the scripture in this regard is Luke chapter 24. And this is after the resurrection. In fact, this is on Easter Sunday morning, the first Easter Sunday morning. Jesus rose from the dead, and the women went to the tomb, and they see that the tomb is empty. John and Peter go to the tomb. They see that the tomb is empty, and suddenly Jesus appears to them, and then suddenly he's gone. Now, after he's gone, notice what happens. Jesus goes, and he appears to two disciples leaving Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus. And it's there that they're talking, and he says to them, well, what's going on? And they're like, do you not know what's going on? Haven't you heard about this? This Jesus who was crucified, now we're saying, we, we don't know what has actually happened. There's rumors all over town. The, the town is nearly exploded. Jerusalem is nearly exploded with the controversies and everything. How could you not know what's going on? And Jesus is simply doing what he does as he teaches through questions very often. He knows the answers to every bit of that, but he's asking them to help them think and assess and learn. And so then we see as he begins to teach them and he reveals who he, they didn't realize who he was, he reveals who he is to them. And look at verse 44. This is so beautiful, and this is on the screen in front of you. Then he said to them, these are my words. Look what he says. Then he says to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Look at verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Isn't that so cool? You see, God reveals his plan, includes us in his plan, shows us his plan. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on, and on the third day rise from the dead, verse 47, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning where? Beginning from Jerusalem. Look at verse 48. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. That's the Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. What a glorious picture that God tells us what the plan is. He reveals what the plan is. If you're a Christian, you know the inside story. You know the real scoop. And we have been given the privilege to being enlightened with what he is doing. Number four, notice that it's not only that he enlists us, he encourages us, he enlightens us with the plan, but then he comes along and he empowers us. He empowered and enabled his disciples. He gives them the ability to do what he's commanding them to do. You see, sometimes we, we kind of think that God's, God's words are too hard for us. Or going to a port in Marseille, in another country, with another language, with another people, that they don't know me, and they, in fact, if they do know anything about me, they tend to reject me, and yet God is saying, no, I am, I am empowering this. I have given you the task, no matter, no matter the barriers. You see, it may not be going to another continent, it may be going to your mother and father's house. That may be like the other continent. It may be going to your brother or your sister's house. That may be like going to the other people group that is against you. It may be like going to your coworkers or going to the person at work that seems to have been so pitted against you, and yet Jesus has a plan to work in their heart, and it's his plan to work in their heart through you. You see, it's the barriers that seem to seem so impossible that God so often loves to use in order to show that it's him and not us. Now, if we will get a hold of this as a church, 
We will go on to the next levels of maturity and growth as we embrace the fact that He has not only called us, but He has enabled us to preach the gospel. Look what it says here, that He indwelt them with His Holy Spirit. This is how He empowers us. And all of His saving power. So we get His Spirit, and with His Spirit comes His power. We see this in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. This was the beginning of this power being given to every believer in Jesus. It's a Jewish festival. That's what Pentecost was. Um, the Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot, this picture of, of waiting 50 days and, and the, the glorious picture of the people of God waiting in this time. And then we see that the Holy Spirit comes as a fulfillment of the promise. Look at the power uh, that comes. It's for signs validating the gospel. If you read the book of Acts, you will read where not only was Jesus doing great works of, of power in order to authenticate his message, but we begin to see that Peter and the apostles are being used of God to pr not only preach the gospel, but then as they would preach the gospel, there were people who were healed, and there were other things that occurred in order to bring a validation to that message. This was a special time period. This was a special epic that we, we see that the signs of the gospel being true are very powerful. In fact, they are a display of God's power. And the apostles are very careful to say, be not confused. It is not us who is doing this. It is God when the people came to worship the apostles, the apostles in proper humility said, do not be impressed with us. You be impressed with the one who does this. And that is a glorious part, validating the gospel, showing them. And not only the power of signs, but also the power for salvation. And all the signs in the world don't mean anything if there is not salvation from sin and death. You see, notice here, it's the salvation fulfilling God's redemptive promise and his redemptive plan. I want you to notice two passages of Scripture, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 18 through 20. I love this, Matthew 10, 18 through 20, and it says, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and to the Gentiles. Jesus is speaking, saying, there's going to be become some tough times. And this is like worst case scenario type witness. Look at verse 19. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you will speak or what you will say. For what you are to say will be given to you at that hour. Verse 20, let's read it out loud together from the screen. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. You see, the Holy Spirit is coming to say, you don't need to be afraid about even the worst case scenarios of being my witnesses. I am going to give you words. Now, you could make a case saying, well, this is specifically about when you're delivered up before kings and queens and, and those who would be opposed to the gospel and governors and persecutors of the faith at these key moments. No, but listen, there are too many times that in my own life I have been put into a situation where it becomes evident that it's not me who is speaking to this person really about their faith and about the explanation that they need. It is God using me. Many, many Christians who begin to walk in faith in the Great Commission and begin to share their faith with other people will testify that, man, it was so amazing. I, I wasn't sure how to answer that issue or that question beforehand, but I just began to speak, and God was speaking through me to them. He gave me the words. You see, one of the reasons that Christians so often will run away from being a witness of Christ is because they're not sure of what the response is. And the fear, fear of men or the fear of men and women will sometimes cause their heart to not be the witness that God has called them to be. But when we see what Jesus has said is, worst case scenario, I'm going to give you everything that you need. Yeah. Friends, Jesus has called us to... Um, 
be his witness, and as we are his witness, he is saying, I will empower you. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. When we talk about his saving power, this is awesome. Ephesians is all about who we are in Christ and defining that very clearly. One of the most encouraging chapters of the Bible is Ephesians chapter 1. I would encourage you as a Christian to spend time in Ephesians chapter 1 and see all of the statements about what Jesus has done for those who are in him. He has given us in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, so many things. And the Apostle Paul is writing to them, and he says to them, I ask that the eyes of your heart be enlightened. He said, I just want you to see this. Be enlightened so that you may know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Verse 19, and the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe. He displayed this power in, working of, in the working of his mighty spirit which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. What God is saying to us is that my power has been given to you not only to save you, but for you to do what I've called you to do. So we just see in all of this, he enlisted his disciples. He encouraged his disciples. He enlightened his disciples. He empowered them. I want you to write down a few final things um, as, we, as we see here. Here's the key point of the whole thing. This is what you need to get. From the start, Jesus has always given his true followers everything, underline that, everything they need to be his witnesses. Here, near, and far. Whether it's right where you are right now, or whether it's those that seem to be a little bit near you, but, but not right where you are, here, near, and far, he's given us everything we need. There's so many times when we've run from being the witness because we, we're wondering, has he really given me what I need? I'm, I, I don't know something, or I don't, I don't have that ability. That, that's, as my dad would say, muah. That, 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 oh, mu, dad, would, whenever he disagrees with something, he goes, muah. I don't know what muah is other than Clell Coleman's statement that that's false. And so when we throw out the resistance that we have everything we need, it's as if we can say muah. He's given us everything we need. The question is, what are we going to do with it? Now, look at your sheet. I want you to write down some things. Number one, we said Jesus enlisted his followers. Would you write out there to the side of that? I have been called. If you're a Christian, you have been called to be a witness. And not just to Marseille, France. And not just to MKs in Poland. And not just to the various places that we have missionaries around the world. But friends, you have been called to be a witness right here in Hollywood, in Aventura, in Plantation, right where we live, in Miami. Number two, we said that Jesus encouraged his followers. Notice this. This morning we've seen that I have his promise. I have his promise that he not only he would rise from the dead, but he says, you will rise from the dead. If any man believe in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And, and we have the promise that he's coming again for us. We have promise after promise after promise that he has made to us. Why would we live in fear? Number three, Jesus enlightened his disciples. Would you put out there to the side, I know his plan. He's shared with me the game book. He's told me what I'm supposed to do. He's told me how it's going to come out. He's told me that it's, that it's good, that he, he has a plan that I can join. I hope you realize that you know his plan. Look at number four. Jesus empowered his followers. Here's the beautiful thing. I have his power. 
It's not your power. It's not your power in which you witness, in which you share, in which you preach. It's his power. You say, in fact, this is what we see throughout the Bible more and more and more, that power is perfected in our weaknesses. For when we are weak, he is strong. So the very things that you think are impossible for you to be a witness by. Listen, Jesus is saying, exactly, exactly. I don't want you to trust in yourself. I don't want you to look to any talents that you have within yourself. I want you to trust in me. And friends, this is what will win the world to Christ. This is God's plan. For us. His famous last words are, go and tell. He has enlisted us, he has encouraged us, he has enlightened us, and he has empowered us. Would you stand with me for prayer?